You'll know if you've been here for a few weeks now that we've been going through our series uh, that we've called Treasures in Heaven. And really what we've been doing is looking at God's kingdom, seeing how it grows, what it's like, what the values are, what makes this kingdom different to every other kingdom that you may have come across um, in your travels around the world. And so we've been looking at this kingdom. This evening what I want us to do is think about the leader of our kingdom because um, leaders make a huge difference, don't they? Uh, That'll be why a lot of the country will be thinking about these two gentlemen uh, in the next year. These are two chaps who people are wondering if they got what it takes to be leaders. Uh, And and political parties know that leaders win or lose general elections, don't they? So here are two guys that we'll be thinking about. But the leader of Christianity, or rather the king of the kingdom, Jesus, is different altogether. And so I don't know what you think about Jesus. Uh, I know in our church we have a whole range of people from different backgrounds, different experience of Christianity. Some people uh, have been Christians for years. Many of you here will have decades and decades of of knowledge and experience of Jesus. Other people won't have ever heard of him before. I've met a few people just this term who've walked into our church building to to sit through a service, and it's literally the first time they've seen a Bible, the first time they've sung a hymn, the first time they've heard of Jesus. So there's a whole range here, probably in this room this evening. Uh, But to get us thinking, I've got a short video we're going to watch of some people's ideas about Jesus. So see if there's anyone here that is saying what your heart is thinking. Um, who is Jesus? I have no idea who Jesus is. I don't know if he exists, but I believe in him. I think it's a person who lived ages ago. Who is Jesus? He is the son of God in the Christian faith. Jesus for me is, a, is also a prophet. He probably was just some fella who walked around with a beard and pretend to and a bottle of wine in his back pocket and switch the water with the wine a couple of times and everyone loved him. Jesus to me is somebody we got taught about in infants and junior school really. There's how many millions of people celebrating his birthday. No one celebrates my birthday like that so surely he must have existed. <laughs> Jesus is uh, my God. He's someone that you know I can relate to, I can pray to, I can talk to. The Son of God, but well, <laughs> apparently we are all God's children, so then what is so great about Jesus? Good question, don't you think? I, I don't know if there's anyone there who you resonated with, anyone who was saying what you were thinking. Uh, maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. Maybe you've got a different idea altogether. But this evening, our passage which we've chosen to look at forces us to take a hard look at Jesus. So if you've got a Bible with you, have it open at chapter 14 of Matthew. Um, If you don't, but maybe you've got one of those little white sheets that came in the news sheets, uh, on one side you should find the reading from this evening. Do do have it in front of you as we look through, see if what I'm saying is what it really says. Uh, Check that I'm telling you uh, what the Bible teaches. Um, And we're going to start off by just looking at a few things which uh, which we learn about Jesus from this passage. So uh, follow with me in your Bibles, uh, chapter 14, verse 13. It says, when Jesus heard about what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. I'm going to stop there. And the first thing which we see about Jesus is this. Maybe we have it up on the screen. The first thing we see about Jesus is that people love Jesus. In fact, people can't get enough of Jesus. This is what you see in this passage, don't you? People cannot get enough of Jesus. Notice what happens here. Jesus gets in the boat. He rows away from the shore and off into the lake. And then people from all the towns around, some who'd met Jesus before, others who'd heard about Jesus, others who heard that other people had heard about Jesus, they, they just start flocking to, to see Jesus. And, and it says at the end of the passage, you probably spotted it when, when Laura read it for us, there are about 5,000 men, plus all their wives and um, their, their mothers, their sisters, aunties, uh, their children, uh, sons, daughters, all that kind of thing. And they all gather. So you're probably looking at a crowd of about 20,000 people gather to see Jesus. But they leave whatever was doing, they leave their dinner to burn in the oven, they leave whatever they're watching on TV, they leave their work, they, they rush because they realise that they might be able to see Jesus. And, and they're all gathered at the side of the lake as the boat pulls up. Uh, that's not what boats do, you can tell I don't sail. As the boat does something, docks, I don't know, anyway, as he rows into uh, land. And Jesus gets out to a crowd of 20,000 people or so, give or take a few, who've gathered to meet him. Now, that should stop you to begin with, shouldn't it? That should stop you and make you think, well, this is someone different. Um, A bit like that woman said about uh, Jesus' birthday and how everyone celebrates that. Well, here you've got a massive crowd who will do anything, who will leave everything to come and see Jesus. Now, before we get any further, whatever you think of Jesus, that tells you something, doesn't it? He's the kind of person that people want to be around. 
And so Jesus starts to heal them, he, he, he teaches them, and this whole thing goes on all the way through the day, uh, right the way through to evening. Um, so the first thing we see about Jesus, which we cannot escape, which must grab your attention, surely, whatever you think of him, is that people are desperate to be around him. People love Jesus. Second thing we see um, as we look at this is in verse 14. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Let me just sketch out some of the context for you so you get where uh, this is coming from and how significant that verse is. You will have seen, if, if you were to read back, um, that this had been a pretty difficult time for Jesus and for his followers. It had been intense. There had been a lot going on. They traveled around. They'd seen crowd after crowd after crowd. Maybe some of the disciples a bit more introverted, just wanted space. Um, and Jesus himself wanted some solitude. Uh, we read in verse um, 1 and following that, that Herod, the Tetrarch, um, heard reports about Jesus. He actually thought that Jesus was John the Baptist, raised to life to kind of terrorize him and haunt him. And so Herod is after Jesus too. He's running for his life in some ways. And so he pushes out into the river, uh, sorry, out into the lake, and uh, wants to get some space. You add to that the fact that his cousin, John the Baptist, has been killed. You have this kind of flashback moment in the, in the chapter, don't you, before um, we get to this. And we see that John the Baptist was beheaded by Herod. This man pursuing Jesus uh, is not someone to mess with. And so Jesus, knowing all of this, being fully God and fully human, experiencing stress, experiencing emotional kind of loads, experiencing exhaustion, wants a bit of space, understandably. So him and his disciples make their way across the other side of the lake. And when he gets out, with this plan in mind for a bit of recuperation, he finds 20,000 people who, who want to see him. They're shouting his name. They're, they're trying to touch him. They want him to, to heal them. They want to hear what he has to say. They want to sit under his teaching. If that was me, or if that was you, what would you do? You turn the boat around a bit more skillfully than I could do, and you row back out into the lake and try and lose them somewhere um, between there and the other side. You try and get some space. You'd ignore the people, forget about them, forget about their needs, forget about the kind of people uh, who are there on the shore. Just ignore them and go. But Jesus isn't like that. Jesus is absolutely full of compassion. And the second thing we see is that Jesus always, always, always puts others first. That's the kind of person he is. Jesus, we see just in these first few verses, is the kind of person who will always go the extra mile for someone else. And as the gospel goes on, those of you who've read it before will know that Jesus goes to the utter end to give himself for other people, doesn't he? That's the kind of person he is. Jesus always, always is others-centered, not self-centered. But as you look at this passage, if you were a first century Jew, you would pick up on a few things which we might miss. Let's read on a bit further and see what Matthew is trying to allude to, what Matthew is trying to um, pick out, the, the images which Jewish people would have been very familiar with. Uh, we're in verse 15, if you're following in your own Bible. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. It's kind of revving up for the miracle now, isn't it? Verse 18. Bring them here to me, he said. We'll stop there for a second on the kind of cliffhanger of something incredibly, incredibly miraculous that will go down in history is about to happen, but, but we'll stop there for a second. And as this story starts to build, as Jesus is about to feed these 20,000 or so people gathered around here, what, what happens is um, Matthew retells the story to remind us of someone else, uh, to remind us of something that's happened long ago in the history of the Jews. If, if you know your Bibles well, maybe you'll be thinking about how similar this story is to another story, or to another part of the Bible. Um, many of you will know the Exodus story. And what's happening here is that Matthew's telling a story here. He's saying that Jesus is like Moses. He's like a new Moses. Think about it. They're in this solitary place. You could call it a wilderness. They're out uh, far away from, 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 um, from towns and villages, hamlets, that kind of thing. They're out in the sticks, and the people are hungry. And if you were to go back to Exodus 16, we won't turn back there now, um, but if you did go back there, you'd find that that's what God's people were like uh, when they left Egypt. Remember, God rescued them uh, under Moses. He took them out of slavery, and they wandered in the wilderness, in the desert, for a long time. And near the start of the chapter, they're really grumbling. They're getting kind of moaning at Moses, saying, why don't you take us back to Egypt? I wish we were back there. We had big pots of stew, and it was all great. And everyone was having, they've got a really selective 
memory, the, uh, the Israelites. They forgot they were slaves, but, but they had big pots of stew, and they loved that. And so, and so they want to go back. Moses, why have you dragged us out here? Why has God dragged us out into the wilderness? And basically, to cut a long story short, what God says is, to keep you fed, I'll rain down bread from heaven. <laughs> and, and every single day from then on, all the way through the time they were in the wilderness, until they reached the promised land, God would rain down this bread from heaven, apart from the Sabbath, and they have enough anyway for that day, would rain down and they would be provided for. And the point is this, that God provides for his people, that God um, gives his people what they need, that, that Moses was the one through whom that happened back in the Old Testament. But here, we see it's happening again. Here are the hungry people out in the wilderness, and what happens? Well, they turn to Jesus to feed them, to provide for them, to give them sustenance. There's one difference. Well, there's a couple of differences, but one significant one I want to show you this evening. In, in Exodus 16, what happens is they go to Moses and God speaks to Moses and God provides the bread and it rains down from heaven, from God. But here in this passage, how are they fed? We're about to see it, aren't we? It's not God who, or God the Father who provides the bread to, to feed the people. It's Jesus himself who takes these loaves, we'll see in a moment, breaks them, and feeds 20,000 people. This incredible miracle is Jesus at work. Not, not Moses, a representative of God, but Jesus, God himself. And that's the point I think we're seeing here, that Jesus is like Moses, but better. Like Moses, but greater. Like Moses. But he can do infinitely more than Moses ever could do, because Moses was just God's man here on earth, whereas Jesus is God incarnate. And that's what we see here in this passage. The point is to just blow our minds with how great and how awesome Jesus is. He's a bit like Moses, but infinitely better. And what I think we find as Christians is that Jesus is enough for us today. Think about the kind of chronology of this or the kind of timeline of that, that story of Exodus. They were in chains. They were slaves. Do you remember that? Kind of when they were baking bricks for Pharaoh before they were rescued. They had all the plagues and God sprung them out of jail. God broke the chains. God rescued them. And they came out of Egypt, um, rescued from their old life. That's like us, isn't it? Those of us who are Christians here this evening, we, we know what it means to be rescued, to have the chains broken, to have been in slavery, and for Jesus to set us free. Like Moses, he sets us free. And where are they then, those Egyptians? Well, when they start to grumble, they're in the wilderness. They're kind of partway between being set free and reaching that promised land. And every step of the way, every day of that week, um, every month, every year, God provided for them what they needed. He never let them go hungry. He sustained them right the way through, from the point where they were rescued and set free to the point where they step into the promised land. He never let them down. And I think that's what we find here with Jesus. If you've got a Bible with you, maybe turn to uh, 2 Peter. 2 Peter. I mean, in this, in this story, Peter, I imagine, is the one who's getting mouthy and uh, disagreeing with Jesus. That's normally the way. And, and later on in his life, just before he died, Peter wrote this letter uh, to Peter, chapter 1, and if you're following, verse 2. And he sums it up really well, I think, what this passage means for us. He, he says here, verse 2, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and, our, and, and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power, that's Jesus' divine power, has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. In other words, through Jesus, this new Moses, we have everything we need for the journey. Right now, we're, we've been sprung out of jail and one day we'll enter into God's promised land, this new creation that is promised for us. But in the meantime, Jesus provides for us every single step of the way. There's not a day that goes past that we won't have all we need for life and godliness. That's what it says here. Now, as Christians, do we believe that? That Jesus gives us everything we need? Maybe not always in the physical sense. Sometimes there are things that we go without. But for what we really need, for our spiritual life and godliness, we have all of that in Jesus. It's a wonderful thing to realize. But as we look at this passage, um, as we see the disciples' little dialogue with Jesus, I think it causes us to question, what's this saying to us? When are we like them? And our next point, which I want us to have a look at, is that sometimes, actually always, I think, we underestimate Jesus. 
always we underestimate Jesus. We massively, massively, massively underestimate Jesus. And so do they here. Uh, look, at me, uh, look with me, sorry, at verse uh, 15. We saw there, didn't we, that the evening approached and then the disciples said to Jesus, see the bit in, uh, in speech marks, this is a remote place and it's already getting dark. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Now, in any other situation with any other person you were talking to, this would be a very sensible thing to suggest. I don't know if your house is like mine, but when people miss a meal or meals are running late, people get grumpy and uh, it doesn't end well. And it would have been the same here, but, but times by 20,000, because there's a lot of them there, and they'd all be getting grumpy. So Peter or John or whoever says, let's go and get some food. Let's call it a day. We can come back tomorrow and uh, have another preaching rally. But for now, let's all go home and have some dinner, okay? Let's send them away, because there's nothing we can do here. We've just got a couple of loaves of bread and some fish. Now, that would be a very sensible thing to do, to call time and to come back tomorrow, if you weren't with Jesus. Just think about what they've experienced already of Jesus. In 13 and a half chapters of knowing him, what has Jesus done? Jesus has, has found people begging because they, they can't walk. And he said, walk, and they walk. He's found people covered in leprous spots. And, and he said to them, be gone, and the spots have disappeared. He's, he saved their very lives. Just a few chapters earlier, they were on this storm on the lake, and it, the, the waves were like nothing they'd ever seen before, these hardened fishermen who knew the waters. And Jesus just clicks his fingers, as it were, and the entire lake goes completely still like a mill pond, and they're rescued, their lives are saved. Jesus even says to a girl who is dead, you're not dead. And because Jesus says it, the girl who was dead comes back to life again. This is the Jesus that they are with here. This Jesus who who can bend the rules of nature at will, who can do whatever he likes, who has, it seems, unlimited power, who can do anything. And and they say to him, oh, we've run out of food. Should we send them away? You know, with anybody else, this would be a, a completely sensible thing to say. But with Jesus there... Surely they've underestimated him just a little bit. The disciples are quite stupid sometimes. And and I think we're quite stupid sometimes as well, aren't we? I think often in the way that we pray, in the way that we evangelize, um, we betray the fact that we will say with our mouths that Jesus is all-powerful, that he's Lord, that he's king of the universe, that he can do anything, that prayer works, and all that kind of stuff. And then very quickly we'll show with our way that we behave that we don't believe. You know, I, I think about the way that I often pray, the, the, the kind of real trivialities that I'll bring to Jesus, but the things that I'll avoid praying about, because honestly, I feel like, well, what can he do? And I wonder if you're like that sometimes, that in your prayers, your prayers are just small, and they're limited, and you pray about the safe things, where actually it's hard to say whether he answered the prayer or not. But when it comes to the things which are big and are serious and matter, you're afraid to pray those prayers because they're maybe not big enough, uh, but you think that Jesus is maybe not big enough to handle them. I think that's what the disciples do here. They have this logistical problem. There's thousands of people who haven't got any food, and they don't think to themselves, well, Jesus, who, who raises the dead, who calms the seas, who makes the lame walk, who gives the blind their sight, uh, he could do something about it. They, they don't even think that. And I think often we do the same. We're, we're faced with a problem or we're faced with a situation, and we don't think to ourselves that Jesus could step in and change it. And so we bring it to him in prayer. Do you have people in, in your life that you, you kind of bump into from time to time who you feel are just beyond saving, you know what I mean? Who, who are, are just too far gone for Jesus to do anything in their lives? Um, I think about when, when I was, um, I'd been a Christian for about a year, and um, I, I'm an only child, and my parents weren't Christians at the time. And, um, and, and for me, the, the absolute miracle would be for my dad to have become a Christian. Um, because he was a really convinced atheist. Um, he had all his arguments worked out. He thought I'd completely lost my mind when I started going to church. Um, some of you will relate to that story. Um, and, and actually, I was not really convinced that anything could be done to change that. Um, I had my arm twisted by some of my friends to invite him to an Alpha course. And so I said to him, what did I say to him? I think I said something like, Dad, would you like to come to an Alpha course? And uh, he said, uh, I'll think about it, uh, which meant no. And uh, so, so he went upstairs, uh, and uh, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And he came back down again, and I said, so will you come? And he said, yeah, okay. And he came along. And uh, this is not a normal story, but within six weeks, seven weeks, he'd become a Christian. God had turned his life around. It was quite a dramatic conversion as well, which you wouldn't have expected from uh, this pretty convinced atheist. Um, shortly after that, within two weeks maybe, my mum became a Christian. So our whole family was transformed within 
the case, a couple of months, really, within a year, perhaps, of me becoming a Christian. I thought this was normal until I met some other people and realized this doesn't often happen. But, but the point I'm trying to make is that I didn't believe it would happen either. I, I look back now, and I thank God for, for what did happen, and that they're still going on with, with Jesus and serving uh, in the church where I became a Christian. But at the time, I couldn't imagine Jesus saving my dad. It's just too impossible. I, I, I couldn't imagine that that could happen. And probably there are people in your life who are exactly the same. You cannot imagine that Jesus could do anything. You know, in, in that case, he could maybe save that person because they're quite nice and they probably would get on all right in church. But in this case, Jesus' his hands are tied. He, he can't do anything. He just shrugs his shoulders. Well, that's not the case. Jesus here is big and powerful and can do anything. And that's what we need to remember, I think, in our prayers and our evangelism, in every sphere of life. We often underestimate Jesus massively. But let's not do that. But, but as we look at this passage and we read on, we're about to get to the miracle bit. It's exciting, isn't it? Um, in verse 18, uh, Jesus asks them to bring the, the little tiny loaves of bread, these little barley loaves, um, and a couple of sardines uh, to him. He, he brings them across, um, and we're about to see how another image from Judaism is, is kind of brought out here, or would have been brought to mind for Matthew's original hearers. Um, so he brings, uh, sorry, they bring the, the bread and the fish to Jesus, and in verse 19... Um, he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Uh, the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people and they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those, this would have been the punchline, wouldn't it, the first time people read this. They weren't, wouldn't be expecting this, I think. They would have known crowds were there, but this would have knocked their socks off. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. This absolutely incredible miracle takes place here. You can read um, some dusty German uh, tomes on, on, on the book of Matthew uh, from maybe the last century or, or the one before. And uh, they're dusty because no one really reads them anymore. But uh, there's good reason for that, and, and it's a good thing, I think. Because they'll tell you that a miracle like this was really just um, that Jesus inspired everyone to share. That Jesus took the bread and the fish, and because that little boy gave his pat lunch, everyone else just went all warm and fuzzy inside. And, and they thought to themselves, oh, that's wonderful, isn't it? And so they got their pat lunches out they'd been hiding in their cloaks. And, and they all shared around. And everyone had so much that there was loads left over. And isn't it wonderful how, how human beings are so generous and kind and, and thoughtful and just a little prod from a little boy and a bit of arm twisting and guilt. And everyone gets along just fine and has a nice lunch. That, that's how they would explain it, um, which is utter rubbish. You read the passage. We've just read it twice, okay, in the last half an hour. And it doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say anything about this. What it says is that Jesus did a miracle, that Jesus does stuff that other people can't do. And he took this bread, and he broke it, and he gave it, and it was enough to just about feed a 12-year-old boy, and it fed all these people. And uh, that's exciting, wasn't it? Fed all these people. And uh, it was a complete miracle, a creative miracle. It was kind of like creation, out of nothing. Jesus made stuff and fed them all, and they were all satisfied. So don't think for a second that this is sort of some nice idea about sharing and generosity and the goodness of humankind. Actually, Jesus never talks about uh, it being anything like that. Or sorry, Matthew or any of the, the gospel writers never say that. This is a miracle. This could not have happened any other way. 20,000 people cannot be fed and satisfied on these five little loaves and a couple of fish. Now, we don't know how it happened, do we? Uh, I think the lack of detail is tantalizing here, isn't it? As Jesus broke it, did it suddenly get bigger? As Jesus broke it, did he just keep on breaking and more and more bread came? As, as he put it in their baskets, did it just never give up? Did they kind of give out portion after portion after portion? And I don't know, was it in people's sight, in their view, or was it kind of hidden in the way that it was done? I don't know. But it was a, an act of creation. It was Jesus working a miracle in this case. And we can't lose sight of that. But, but I think uh, the picture is deeper. The picture is more amazing than we realize. If you're a Jewish person reading this, not only would you see the Moses imagery, not only would you see this uh, picture of God feeding uh, his people in the wilderness, providing for them for the journey, you'd also see something else. You'd see the imagery of a banquet. You see, Jewish people expected a king like Jesus. Well, not like Jesus, but they expected a king. They were surprised when it was him. Some doubted. But, but they were expecting that when this Messiah, this Christ came, he would bring about the end of time and he would bring about a great feast, a celebration, a banquet to um, celebrate the, the fact that God had triumphed and that God's kingdom was 
uh, reigning across the whole of the earth. It would be a great celebration. And so they were expecting this. And, and there's a few clues here that show us that this is what, what um, Matthew has in mind, or what Jesus had in mind as he did this, and as Matthew recorded it. Um, you'll see in verse 19, it says he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Now, it's not the best translation, um, sit down. It's a bit weak. What it should be is reclined. And it's this very specific kind of reclining. You do it a, a, a kind of fancy um, dinner. If you went to a big banquet, everyone would recline back, ready to eat their meals. You've seen kind of um, first century Middle Eastern dining, and it was eaten, um, sitting down, reclining, um, as they would do before a banquet. And, and it's kind of pointing to this banquet idea. You see a little bit later on as well that it talks about how everyone was satisfied. You see in verse 19, um, I think it is. Is it verse 19? No, verse 20, sorry. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces. This sense of satisfaction shows it wasn't just a little meal. It should have been, shouldn't it? A couple of crusty loaves and, uh, and a couple of sardines or whatever. This, this was not an amazing uh, feast to satisfy you, but this is kind of Christmas Day full. You know, when you're, you, you think you can, you, you've expa- you, you're not wearing a belt anymore because you've given up on that. You've, your stomach is bloated. You, you roll into the living room to watch the Queen's speech, and you, you can't imagine eating anything else ever again. You're just so full and so satisfied. It's that kind of meal here. And for a Jewish person, those kinds of references would make them think of this banquet the Messiah would host. And we find that Jesus is the host of this great, ultimate, eternal, messianic banquet. I, I want to share with you a passage which sums this up pretty well. In the book of Isaiah, um, don't worry about turning there, but in the book of Isaiah, it talks about the end of time. Uh, not just looking back to, to Moses, but looking forward now to this future time when Jesus will reign. And it says this about the banquet, which Jesus is the host of. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all people, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds the people, the sheet that covers the nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will re- uh, remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, he will say, they will say, sorry, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. See, the whole of the Bible is pointing forward to this day, to this great banquet which Jesus will host. Uh, We think about Jesus, the the one who's like Moses, but better, who rescues us from from slavery, who frees us, who breaks the prison cell free and sets us loose. Uh, He's the one who who stands with us all the way through the wilderness, through this, this life that we're in now. He provides for us everything we need for life and godliness. You remember that imagery of Moses? And he's the one who one day will welcome us into a new creation. He's the one who will welcome us into this world, turned back to how it ought to have been, with all the the evil and the sin just, just stripped away, stripped out, and all the good restored to what it ought to have been. You think about that, that just... A little tiny phrase there that comes up again in 1 Corinthians 15, that death will be swallowed up. Paul says swallowed up in victory because Jesus has defeated it. And one day this banquet will be something that all of us will share. Those of us who've trusted Jesus can say what it says there. We trusted in him for salvation and we rejoice. To sit down with Jesus who wipes away every tear and to feast with him and celebrate for all eternity. That's what we get a picture of here in chapter 14 of Matthew. As Jesus shares out this bread and this fish, we see the king of the world, the king of this kingdom, who will one day bring us home. Amazing image, isn't it? The incredible king that is king of this kingdom. The only kingdom I want to be a part of if he's in charge. And it makes me just think for one more second about the, the last thing that we come to. Because we've talked a lot about Jesus, and I'm glad we have. I wouldn't want to talk about anybody else here, but let's just think a little bit about these disciples. Because what interests me here is that they're involved at all. I think that's quite funny, isn't it? Because, I mean, what do they do? They provide the, the five crusty loaves and uh, pieces of fish, which is, which is nice, but it doesn't really do anything, does it? Uh, Jesus didn't need the, the bread and the fish that they brought. He really didn't need it at all. It's quite nice that they provide it, and the little boy contributes his lunch. But really, what is their contribution? It's absolutely minuscule. Jesus, if he can create however many thousand loaves of bread, he could create a couple more if he needed to. Jesus really doesn't need them. Did did he need them to distribute the bread, to go around with their baskets and 
and, and hand all the bread out to people than to collect in all the incredible um, amounts of leftovers. He didn't need that, really, did he? Jesus could have clicked his fingers and bread on parachutes would have floated down from the sky and uh, fish um, on parachutes would have floated down from the sky. It would have been lovely, wouldn't it? And Jesus could have done that. He really didn't need them at all. Uh, and they're pretty useless in this whole thing. They, 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 they misunderstand Jesus. They're, they're quite thick. They, they don't really contribute much at all. But what I see in this passage is that Jesus loves to use people like that, which warms my heart. <laughs> and I think it will warm yours as well, because Jesus takes people who are very inadequate, people who don't have an awful lot to offer him. And what we see in this little story here is that Jesus takes their very small offering and he transforms it into something incredible. You, you look there, the, the amount that was collected afterwards, the, the broken pieces, um, added up to 12 baskets full. Now these were, I don't know, we don't have baskets for our bread, do we? But sometimes in communion you hand around those little baskets, maybe 12 of them, maybe 12 big fat baskets of, of bread, way more than was handed out uh, to begin with. It is, it's amazing how Jesus takes their, their little offering, their offering that isn't enough, they're offering that is inadequate. They're offering that cannot possibly do the job, that can't feed all these people. And he turns it into something great. In Jesus' hands, what we bring to him is transformed into something that's worthwhile. Just to remind you again, I was telling you about my parents. And um, at that point, I was probably 13, 14. Um, I didn't have any decent answers uh, to their difficult questions. My my mum was quite, she was quite pleased that I was going to church. I think she thought it would keep me out of trouble. But um, my dad didn't like the idea at all. He thought I'd just lost my mind, as I said. And he had some really big objections. Um, I didn't have any clever answers. Um, to be honest, I wasn't praying for them particularly hard. Some of you pray fervently for your parents and, and, and others that you care about that don't know Jesus. I wasn't really doing that. Um, I didn't really have a particularly consistent witness. Uh, most 13-year-old Christians... Um, that I meet um, have their ups and downs like all of us do, and that was me. My offering was absolutely tiny, and, and what I had to bring to this saving my parents plan was really, really small. And what amazes me as I look back now, just thinking about it this afternoon, um, as I was preparing for, for this evening, is that Jesus took this, this little 13-year-old who didn't really know his Bible, who didn't pray much, whose witness was up and down uh, like nobody's business, and through that, he saved two sensible, grown people, <laughs> two adults. It is, it's ridiculous, isn't it? It's, it's madness. You wouldn't expect it to pan out like that. But that's what Jesus does time and time again. He takes our weakness, or he takes our inadequacy, or he takes the things which we think are not really very useful to him. And he turns them around. He transforms them. He, um, he, he upcycles them into something great, into something that's worthwhile for the kingdom. And that's what I saw in my parents' lives. And, and I imagine most of you, if you just think for a few moments, you can think of times where he's done that, maybe to you or, or through you in other people's lives. So please, this evening, do not sit in, in your pew and, and think to yourself that you haven't really got anything to offer Jesus. Actually, no, you can think that because it's true, but don't think that that disqualifies you from serving. But that's the point, isn't it? These disciples really didn't have any useful solutions. They didn't have any answers. They didn't have anything helpful to offer all they had was this stupid little fish and bread. And they came to Jesus, and Jesus, in his hands, transformed what they brought into something useful that did the job. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, I cannot do anything in church. I can't think where I would fit in. I can't think how I could be useful to Jesus in this world. Maybe. That's exactly where you want to start. And ask Jesus, well, how can you use me? And see how Jesus does lead you. As, you. as you step out in faith and see how he takes your, your pretty useless offering and uses it to bless other people, to extend the kingdom, to bring him glory in this world. It might be that the thought of having a, an uncovered discussion with your uh, non-Christian friend is absolutely terrifying. These are um, something which we've been doing quite a bit recently. We've been um, opening Luke's gospel uh, with non-Christians and just asking them to explore Jesus and and, and asking questions, and it's, it's actually easier than you think, but for many of us, it's quite an intimidating thing to do. Maybe you don't feel up to it. What if they ask a question I can't answer? What if they um, uh, have objections which I, I just don't know where to go with? Um, what if they uh, find out that I'm not quite such a good Christian as uh, I give the impression I am? You may feel incredibly inadequate, but that's just the place we want to begin if, if Jesus is going to use us. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, um, I'd like to help with, I don't know, the care homes and, and go in and sit in one of these carol services and just 
uh, befriend some of the older people uh, and show Jesus' love to them. But I don't know how I'd begin in conversation. I'd feel so awkward. I, I don't have the confidence to do that. But that's fine. Jesus takes people with very little confidence and he uses them when we step out. There's all kinds of things, isn't there, which Jesus might call us to do. And thinking that we need to prepare ourselves and get ready and have all the answers and be sorted and be fixed before we can do these things. So that's the wrong way around because in God's kingdom, he takes people who are broken, people who are pretty useless, people who have no idea how they're going to be helpful, who just bring a fish. And, and Jesus uses those people to transform the world. That's what we see here with these disciples. That's what I've seen time and time again as I've spent time with Christians. It's what I see in my own life as well. So please don't think you need to fix yourself before you can be useful for Jesus. Jesus, this great king of this kingdom, the one who rescues us, the one who sustains us, the one who one day will bring us home to this glorious banquet that goes on forever. The funny thing is he who flung the stars into space, who made everything, the one who is the creator we see revealed here, the almighty lord of the universe, who will one day sit on the throne of history, he likes to use us <laughs> and to involve us in his kingdom. It's an incredible thing, isn't it? What a privilege to serve with Jesus. Before we go any further, before we sing our next song, maybe let's just take a moment. We're in this stewardship season. We talked about our time, about our prayers, about our money, all sorts of things. Maybe just as we close this sermon, let's think about how we use our skills or lack of for Jesus. So let's close our eyes and let's just take a moment to think. How could Jesus use us? There might be some people here this evening who feel that they're really not sure how Jesus could use them at all. They're not sure if there's a place for them in his body. Uh, they don't see how this community here could be impacted by Jesus through them. Father, I pray that you would help each of us this evening to see how you could use us. Lord, there is so much need in our world. There are so many people who are living and dying and they don't know Jesus. They've never heard the good news we think of the crowd at the start of this um, passage who just longed to see Jesus. When people see Jesus, the real Jesus, not just church and religion and tradition. Father, when people see Jesus, they long for him. And Jesus, there are so many people who long for you in this world. Father, I pray that you'd help each of us to find how we fit in, where we feel inadequate. Remind us of your adequacy. Where we feel weak, Father, remind us of your strength. Father, where we feel stupid and ignorant of issues that people might have, Lord, remind us of your wisdom. Father, I pray that we would learn from the disciples' mistakes. We'd learn from our own mistakes. I pray that we would be able to serve Jesus, King of kings, that we would be able to serve him until he returns and wraps everything up and brings history to a close and makes this world how it ought to be. Father, I pray that you would keep us going, sustain us day by day by that bread that Jesus provides till one day he calls us home. I pray all this in his glorious name. Amen.